Open the podcast bay door as hell. And welcome to episode 71 of Welcome to Geek Town. I'm your host, Kurt Onstead. I've been a proud geek all my life, being into role playing games, board games, sci fi, fantasy, and especially superheroes and comics. And I want to help others join me in those pursuits. But I've found that sometimes people can get overwhelmed or feel left out because they don't already have what some consider the requisite knowledge to be considered a fan. And that's where Welcome to Geek Town comes in. Here, you can ask your questions without feeling like a gatekeeper is calling you out for not yet being fully versed in every aspect of your new interest. A quick reminder that this show is powered by your questions. If there's anything you have been dying to ask, or even just a little curious about, please send those in to Welcome to Geek Town, all spelled out, at gmail.com. Or you can go to the website, welcome to, the number two in this case, geektown.com, and click the Submit a Question link if you prefer to remain anonymous. I hope to hear from you soon. This week, we're going to revisit a question from Joel L., who wanted to know about some of the more unusual deaths in comics. The first time we looked at this somewhat morbid topic, we examined the out-of-continuity death of Mary Jane Watson in Spider-Man Reign. Now we move over to DC, where an incontinuity death had a greater effect on our world than it did on the characters of that comic book universe. Let's turn our attention to the death of Alex DeWitt. First, let's get some background. As we've mentioned a few times on the show, in the 90s, DC attempted to catch lightning in a bottle a second time after the massive success of the Death of Superman story. They were somewhat successful with the Nightfall story, breaking Bruce Wayne's back. Check out episode 68 where I go into greater detail on this story and Bruce's replacements. And their third attempt was a story focused on Green Lantern titled... Emerald Twilight. In this tale, after the loss of his hometown of Coast City, destroyed in the climax of the Return of Superman story, the Green Lantern of Earth, Hal Jordan, apparently went insane with grief and, in a violation of his oath, attempted to recreate the city and its inhabitants in order to return things to normal. But with the limited power of the Green Lantern Ring, he could not create this illusion for long, and so flew to Oa, the location of the Green Lantern Corps' power source, and after fighting and killing a number of his fellow lanterns along the way, stepped into the central battery and absorbed all of its power. Now calling himself Parallax, he went on a quest to remake the universe in a manner he felt was more fair. That ended up leading to the Zero Hour soft reboot. Episode 1 of Welcome to Geek Town goes into further details on that. Hal's true motivations were later retconned in the Green Lantern Rebirth miniseries. However, that isn't as important for this story as the immediate aftermath of Hal's assault on Oa. Ganthet, the one remaining guardian, the inhabitants of Oa and the leaders of the Green Lantern Corps, used his own powers to reform one ring and went to Earth to bestow it upon one lucky person. That individual happened to be Kyle Rayner, a struggling freelance artist living in Los Angeles. Ganthet basically said, yeah, you'll do and gave the ring to Kyle with no instructions other than responding to Kyle's question of what do I do with what you must. 
This finally brings us to the subject of this tale, Alexandra, or Alex, DeWitt. The on-again, off-again girlfriend of Kyle, she and Kyle were briefly introduced in Green Lantern number 48 in a single panel appearance where we didn't even learn their names. Kyle gets the ring at the end of issue number 50, and in issue 51 goes to tell Alex what happened. Through this conversation, we learn that the pair are currently broken up, despite Kyle's wishes, and that Alex is, like Kyle, unsuccessful in her career so far, in her case as a photojournalist. Kyle suggests that the pair move to New York and use Kyle's new powers for him to become a hero, while Alex can be his own personal Jimmy Olsen and become known for her photographs of the new Green Lantern. Alex reluctantly agrees, although she's not ready to take Kyle back as a boyfriend yet, feeling he is still not mature enough. After a couple of issues, while still making plans for their move to New York, and after Kyle takes down a couple of supervillains, Alex does invite Kyle back into the bedroom, and they are boyfriend and girlfriend once again. Meanwhile, as a recurring subplot, we see some government agents looking into this new Green Lantern, believing they have the opportunity to claim the power for the U.S. while it's in the hands of a relative rookie. In their investigations, they note the connection between this new Green Lantern and photojournalist Alex DeWitt. They send their superpowered agent named Major Force to retrieve the ring by whatever means necessary. Unfortunately, Major Force is also a major psycho, and decides to break into Alex's apartment and torture her for information on Green Lantern. She denies knowing the hero to the end. Major Force kills her, and in a particularly cruel act, stuffs her into the refrigerator, leaving behind a note saying, Left a surprise for you in the fridge, signed simply A. Major Force then hides and waits for Green Lantern to find her. When Kyle returns to Alex's apartment and lets himself in, he finds the note and opens up the fridge to discover Alex's dead body. Shortly after, Major Force reveals himself and he and Green Lantern fight. In his rage, Kyle tries to kill the government agent, creating an electric chair with his power ring, but is unsuccessful. Meanwhile, the police show up, and, finding a dead girl in a fridge, and one character trying to kill the other, assume Green Lantern is the killer. Major Force falls back on his government connections, and Kyle flies away to escape the cops and grieve alone. This event takes place in issue 54 of Green Lantern. As I noted earlier, Alex gets her first appearance in issue number 48, but doesn't start getting any meaningful dialogue until issue number 51. So her entire story is told in somewhere between three and six months of issues, covering only a couple of weeks or so of in-universe time. Now, for certain characters, a supporting cast's death is the defining moment of their origin and or motivation for becoming a hero. Uncle Ben, Thomas and Martha Wayne, and Superman's Kryptonian parents, Lara and Jor-El, are a few examples. But that wasn't the case for Kyle. As soon as he realizes what the ring can do, he decides to become a superhero, with no tragedy necessary to motivate him to do the right thing. And while we do have a few scenes of him grieving Alex's death and saying he feels responsible... By issue number 60, Kyle is already in a new relationship with Donna Troy of the Titans, one of multiple romances he has during his tenure as the star of the Green Lantern title. Occasionally, like in the Blackest Night storyline, this death will be referenced and used to pile guilt onto Kyle, but overall it wasn't a character-defining moment for the young hero. And... Even if it had been, some fans felt this death was particularly cheap. 
including one named Gail Simone. She noted other female characters who have been similarly treated, either being killed, depowered, assaulted, or otherwise abused in the name of character development. Sometimes the woman herself, but just as often these stories were used to quote-unquote develop a male character who reacted to the event. She and others collated a list which spread around the internet. Eventually, a website was created titled Women in Refrigerators. I'll provide a link on the show notes at the Welcome to Geek Town website. This website included the list, as well as reactions to it from a number of comic book professionals, some agreeing that this was an unfortunate trend, others defending the practice, basically saying, well, it happens to male characters too. This is true to a certain extent. However, while I can't find any statistics to support or disprove this, it's been noted that while most male characters overcome their death or alteration, female characters tend to stay dead, depowered, or otherwise changed for much longer, if not basically forever. Compare the length of time Bruce Wayne had a broken back to Barbara Gordon with the same injury, for instance, and you get an idea of what I'm talking about. And that was basically Gail's point. Like myself, she wants to have more female readers in comics. And to quote her, If you demolish most of the characters girls like, then girls won't read comics. Thanks to Gail's open letter, and subsequent website, fridging has now become a generic term for quickly killing off a, usually female, character as a plot device. And just like in many fantasy tales, naming a thing gives us some power over it. Since then, many creators from multiple media have made an effort to avoid fridging their characters, and are called out by fans and fellow pros when they do. Of course, it still happens, and depending on your point of view, some of those accusations of fridging may be false. But by pointing it out and providing a name for the trope, Alex's death in the comic book world has hopefully changed things for the better here in the real world by giving us fewer meaningless deaths from writers too lazy to come up with something better. In addition to all of this, it also helped introduce the world to Gail Simone. Because of her activism with regards to this, Gail found herself with a weekly column at the Comic Book Resources website titled, You'll All Be Sorry. From there, she found work as a comic book writer, first for Bongo Comics, who published the Simpsons, Futurama, and related titles, then moving on to Marvel and DC. In particular, her run on Birds of Prey is considered the gold standard for that book. And the Secret Six title, spinning off the Villains United miniseries, gave lesser-known villains a chance to shine as anti-heroes, including Catman, Ragdoll, Scandal Savage, the daughter of Vandal Savage, her lover Knockout, and Bane, who acted as sort of a replacement father figure to Scandal and Knockout. She also wrote one of my favorite episodes of Justice League Unlimited, titled Double Date, featuring Green Arrow, Black Canary, Question, and the Huntress. Gale continues to be a well-known name in the comics world, and has one of the most fun Twitter pages out there, as she goes back and forth between loving interactions with fan and fellow pros, and playfully trolling in a way that never feels hurtful towards anyone. As I mentioned back in episode 60, Gail organized the Comics Writers Challenge through her Twitter, which ended up raising over $300,000 for Black Lives Matters and other similar organizations. So, even if Alex DeWitt is no longer mourned by the characters of the DC Universe, her death affected major change in this one. And I think that qualifies as unusual enough to fall under Joel's question. I hope you all enjoyed this episode, and, as always, 
I'm definitely looking for more questions to answer for future episodes. So be sure to send those in, or any comments you have on the show in general, to me via email at welcome to geektown, all spelled out, at gmail.com. Or you can go to the website, welcome to, the number two in this case, geektown.com, and click the submit a question link if you'd prefer to remain anonymous. Other contact options include facebook.com slash welcome to geektown or twitter at geektown podcast. Also, if you'd like to support the show directly, come join the Patreon at patreon.com slash welcome to geektown for just a dollar per month to get access to full scripts of the shows, outtakes, and a monthly shout out. You can also help the show grow by subscribing and giving a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts to join the Geek Town City Council, which helps other people find the show, so we can all tell them, Welcome to Geek Town, Population, Us. Welcome to Geek Town is written, narrated, edited, and produced by me, Kurt Onstead. Theme music is by Aaron Lovitz, logo art by Archie Santana. All other sound clips are the copyrighted material of their respective owners, and no infringement is intended, falling under fair use. <laughs>